Well, everyone, thanks for joining this this morning. We uh, our panel today is about securing Asia. And when I was looking at the program, there are panels about Silicon Valley investing, economic opportunity, economic growth. And I think the four of us are sort of the doomsday guys, where we get called in to talk about. There's a lot going on, but also there are some security concerns that we should really be thinking about with respect to the region. And we're fortunate to have a really terrific panel uh, crossing a huge amount of both academia and policy. I'm gonna briefly mention who's on the panel and then we'll launch right in. And I wanna leave some time at the end for questions because I know just from looking around, there's a huge amount of expertise in the audience as well. So on our panel here, we have Ambassador Mark Lippert. Mark has had nearly every significant Asia policy job in the United States government. Before serving as our ambassador to South Korea, he was Chief of Staff to Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel. He was Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian Pacific Affairs. And before that, as the Chief of Staff at the National Security Council, work on those issues as well. We have uh, Shashi Jai Kumar, who is at the head of the Center of Excellence at the National Security uh, for national security in Singapore. In addition to that, he's had some of the most senior positions in the Singapore government as well. And then finally, we have Professor Ichi Katahara, the professor of the National Institute of Defense Studies in Japan. Uh, so why don't we launch in, as we talk about some of the security challenges and dynamics in the region, I'd like to start by giving us a laydown of exactly what are the challenges that we face. So Mark, if I can turn to you first, as we talked about, you said you wore a lot of different hats and have a unique vantage point from the American perspective of the laydown of the issues in the region. Can you start us off by giving us a laydown of why are these countries in the region becoming more, feeling more concerned about security and looking towards defense purchases? And take us a step back and give us an overview of the security in, in the region. Sure. Uh, well, thanks, Matt, and thanks for the introduction and all of the jobs mean. Those positions mean that basically I can't hold a job. Uh, so anyway, I'll, and second, uh, looking at the audience, really esteemed group here, so really interested in the participatory part of this um, sort of, because I think there's a lot to offer uh, coming up to the stage. I, I would just, I'll be brief and give an overly simplistic lay down basically from the US vantage point, but I, I would put it in three buckets. First, uh, the way I think about it is you've got the American uh, treaty allies and then a sort of subgroup of that close defense partners, right, that aren't formal allies, but all but formal allies exhibit a Singapore, right? Um, so there's, you know, a group of five to seven of those countries. And I think that's one area that, you know, is you have to look at first and foremost. And in the Obama administration in 2009, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk about the president just forming a G2 with the Chinese and trying to sort everything out that way. President Obama made the opposite choice. He decided to run an alliance first structure. Basically, his theory of the case was the US will be far better off in the Asia Pacific Indian uh, subcontinent region if we get our uh, treaty allies as strong as possible, as close as possible, and have our strategic interests aligned first and foremost. And you saw over the course of six months, visits, very first visit, uh, to the White House actually was by the Japanese Prime Minister, followed shortly thereafter by the Australians, the Koreans, <clears throat> and then eventually very first state dinner, uh, the Prime Minister of India. Um, so um, I think that we felt that really getting those allies um, right uh, was very important. And that the India comment brings me to the second bucket, which is then it's uh, how do you engage with and deal with the emerging powers? And you know, everybody obviously rightly thinks of China in this bucket, and they are a major driver of a political security and economic change in the region. But you would be remiss if you didn't also uh, put India and Indonesia uh, in those in that second category as well. And thinking through where we are on those issues today are really important. I'll just make one comment because this is you know a subject of a, a panel here today. But uh, Shiv Shankar Menon, the Ambassador Menon, made the comment uh, to me that you know India and China for a long time. Um, we're able to kind of keep some distance from each other. But now they're growing rapidly, emerging onto the international scene. And the interests of those two countries alone are starting to bump up against each other. And what that poses for US interests and US treaty allies' interests in the region is a very significant question. Last but not least, and I'll stop on this, is that obviously you have then the big bucket of multilateral uh, institutions, right? You have EAS, APEC, ADDM+, the whole alphabet soup of security, political 
political. And then also, I think you, you have to put economic uh, uh, multilateral institutions in there and how you engage with those. Some are strong and effective, some are weaker, some are nascent and growing, some are um, resourced uh, accordingly, and some are more backwater. So how you sort of sift through those multilateral institutions and what is that architecture going to look like with the U.S. treaty alliances and with the emerging powers uh, in the region, I think is central to how one thinks about security in Asia, and I'll stop there. Great, thanks, Mark. I mean, that's, I mean, the point you made, it is complex, it is vast, and actually, when you look at the dynamics of not just the United States and China, but India, Indonesia, and the multilateral institutions, it's not necessarily where we're focusing our time, and there's some broader things there. Uh, Professor, I'd like to turn to you next, Professor Katahara, Taking that point, as we look at from the security architecture, from where you sit in Japan, from maybe a regional perspective, what are the security threats that are keeping you and the other countries up at night? And where, what are the new threats and what are the threats that have maybe gotten worse and what are some of that have been mitigated as you're thinking about this, this landscape? Uh, thank you, Chair. First of all, I just want to make some, some caveats. I'm a government official uh, from the Ministry of Defense think tank, but uh, what I say does not represent the views of the government, just my personal uh, perspective only. Let me make four points related to your question. I think, number one, uh, nuclear North Korea with ballistic missiles really poses direct military threat to Japan, to Korea, to China, to the U.S.-Japan alliance and to the region at large. Now the situation is becoming really dangerous and I, I, I can't see any exit uh, from uh, prevailing circumstances. And so that's why some people in Japan are talking about the possibility of Japan introducing some kind of strike, strike capability. Japan has been, we do not have any you know, offensive power projection capability, but there are some people in Japan who are feel very threatened, that they feel the need for some uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, more deterrent uh, capability for Japan. Now it's on, on, on debate, Japanese people are debating quite actively. Second, uh, we are concerned about uh, assertive Chinese activity as well as Russian activities in the areas surrounding Japan. And those activities can be interpreted as a, an action uh, uh, that have the effect of undermining a rules-based international order. That's our very major concern. Thirdly, in my view, uh, American, the unpredictable and uncertain American administration also poses a, quite a challenge for security policymakers, not only in Japan, but also allies in the region, also maybe in the world. And, and finally, we are confronted with a host of uh, non-traditional security challenges like uh, terrorism and natural disaster. Thank you. So that's great. So you, I mean, you outlined in particular at the end some of the non-traditional challenges, security, uh, terrorism, which of course is different, uh, challenges to address in a different way than ways we usually think of a traditional large arms purposes, purchases. And also there are other challenges with respect to Southeast Asia and India. So Sasha, I wonder if I could turn to you to see if you want to offer a perspective maybe moving away from just the East Asian side to the larger Asian picture as Mark start off, started us off on. Yeah, thanks very much, Matt. Um, happy to be back here again. Um, let me comment it from this particular point of view. I'm also formerly from government. Um, I tried to be an academic, didn't quite make it, was in government, now back in academia again, so I, I can't hold the job as well. I'm speaking uh, from the perspective of academia, maybe from a government-informed perspective, if, if that's okay. Um, the problem I have is that when I'm on the, on the conference circuit, not so much in this country, but more in, in Europe, trying to educate people about or elucidate views on terrorism in Southeast Asia, you know how these conferences work. You're given 10 minutes to give your spiel. IS is moving to Southeast Asia. At the end of the 10 minutes, there's dead silence. They, they don't want to hear it. Uh, generally speaking, not too interested, and there's a reason for that. If you look at what's happened in France, Germany, the UK, IS is seen almost as existential vis-a-vis -vis the, the West. It's an IS versus the West threat. But if you look empirically at the accumulation of attacks, uh, returning foreign fighter floats, and so on and so forth, it is actually clear that the, the action is actually moving to Asia and Southeast Asia in, in particular. That's a great worry. It's a great worry because people don't really pay enough attention to it. 
For a few months now, you've had the ongoing crisis in the southern Philippines, particularly Marawi, and it's clear that this has become a magnet for foreign fighters who are bouncing around the, the rat line in Southeast Asia. And in the small numbers, foreign fighters who are seeking escape from either Mosul or, or Raqqa. So the numbers of people who have been killed in Marawi is, is it's small. But the identities of them, allegedly, Saudis, Chechens, Jordanians, besides obviously the, the odd Malaysian and Indonesian, and that's very, very worrying. So that part could become the new Afghanistan of Southeast Asia. It may, may well be a matter of time before Islamic State declares a, a wilayat in, in that part of Southeast Asia. And of course, after uh, facing strategic reverses in Mosul and Raqqa, they, they need new places, they need new success stories. So that's one. Uh, what's commonly not acknowledged, but which seems to be playing itself out, is that that may well just end up being the, the eastern flank of IS in Southeast Asia. What you have in the West, uh, increasingly, if you've been reading the news over the last few days, is what's happening in Rakhine State. Now, um, years ago when I was in the Ministry of Defense looking at radicalization terrorism issues, the big groups which supported the cause of the Rohingya or Rohingya independence, the, the RSO, uh, the Arakai national, national movements were commonly dismissed uh, as jokes. They were defunct or shell organizations. No more is this the case, I think. If you look at ARSA, which is the name of the group, the Arakan Sal Salvation uh, uh, Front, which is the main body which supports the claims of the Rohingyas, it's clearly sort of organized, maybe not so well armed, although that may change. And in addition, according to the best research, which is ICG research and, and other groups, these are people who are indoctrinated, who've got the ideology, who are trained in uh, Saudi Arabia, all kinds of other places. So that's also very, very worrying, because if you put the two together and you combine that with what IS Central and also Al-Qaeda, which is jumping on the bandwagon, are saying about the two con conflicts, these are probably the two new nodes, not just in Asia, but, but worldwide, the future evolutions for, for IS and Al-Qaeda, which because of their strategic reverses, have to seek new fronts. So, so that's, Sashi, that's yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. an interesting point that you raised. I mean, mm. talking about the strategic conversion of the Islamic State, terrorism threats, I think builds on just one early theme that we were talking about is within Asia, of course, there's a North Korea and China threat, but realizing there are threats that we are not spending our time thinking about very much, both the Islamic State terrorist threat, Mark, as you mentioned, looking at the emerging powers that gets less bandwidth than what we're talking about now, as we go into what some of the responses are of these countries to build up their own defenses, I want to pull on one thing that you said, uh, Professor Katahara, about the United States. I was at this conference last year, and the black elephant in the room, if you were, is talking about what would a Trump administration mean for Asia policy? Uh, people laughed it off and frankly didn't think that that was a question we'd be talking about two months after the conference. And now, of course, this is something that is front and center. So, Professor, you mentioned that insecurity about the American commitment may be one of the security threats we're thinking about. Can you talk us a little bit about how America's Asia policy now under President Trump is viewed and how that relates to some of the security challenges and the moves within the region to provide more for their own security or to take different measures? Well, first of all, uh, I think uh, uh, there are some continuities and discontinuities uh, between Trump administration and also the you know, Obama administration. But still, at this stage, uh, Trump administration is still in the process of, uh, of uh, formulating its own strategy for Asia or for, for the world. So we, we, we still do not know uh, the clear picture of what Trump government is trying to do for Asia, or for China, for Japan. But uh, generally speaking, uh, as far as the alliance is concerned, I think still we have a strong confidence about the continuation and strengthening of the Japan and US alliance. And also we can see uh, some more broader uh, uh, contributions by American allies like Australia, Japan, Southeast Asia to international security affairs. You know, There's some awareness of, uh, of the regional countries to, to, to do more for, uh, for security in the region. We, I think uh, uh, for the last 70 years, uh, we have relied on the United States for our, uh, our guarantor of our security. But now is the time for us to rethink about future security uh, 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 structure for the region. You know, maybe we are maybe in, in, in time of transition. And is that a transition? Are those trends 
already ongoing and have they that the President Trump has accelerated, been a catalyst for exposed, or if we were sitting here and talking about what President Hillary Clinton's Asia strategy was, would we actually be having a similar conversation about moves to take more internal measures for countries themselves providing for their own defense? Well, basically speaking, uh, we, have, we see rise of China, rise of India, you know, also rise of Islamic powers in the world. So apparently, American power has been in decline, comparatively speaking, you know. And, and in, addition, in addition to that, we see uh, President Trump uh, talking about something very you know, funny things about, about the world. You know, he keeps tweeting every day. Is it uh, a kind of American foreign you know, official policy? No, I don't think so. But to us, you know, Trump, Mr. Trump gives us a sort of a misleading message to, to the rest of the world. You know? So we are very confused about what America has been doing so far you know, after the you know, inauguration of the Trump government. Right, so Professor Gajahar had said something. One of the interesting things you said is it's not just the proxima causes, but American power has been in decline in nature, this perception through. Mark, turning to you, that stands in contrast in large part to I think one of the more significant foreign policy initiatives of the Obama administration, which was the rebalance or the pivot towards Asia, something that you saw in various parts throughout the administration. So as we think about the security environment, what's your view on what the rebalance means today? Is it over? Is it continuing? Is there, what does it mean under the next four years of the Trump administration? And how does that relate to the Asian security environment now? No, it's, it's a great question. And, um, you know, I would say, um, I heard a lot about the U.S. being in decline, you know, in, in, when I was in government. And I just categorically reject that. I think there was, a misperception, uh, well, let me just take two examples. First, there was a misperception that a bunch of guys on Wall Street who figured out some crazy financial instrument that almost brought down the U.S. financial uh, uh, you know, system and quite frankly had an impact on the globe, equated to a, that the fundamentals of the U.S. as a country were in decline somehow. And, you know, I would just challenge, I would challenge that over and over again. I mean, strong institutions, uh, the world's largest energy reserves, a growing population uh, outside of France, the only industrialized country with a growing population, so on and so forth. So I always challenge the notion that, you know, the Wall Street financial crisis somehow uh, it basically meant that we were in decline as a country. And moreover, I would say coming through that, it showed the resiliency and resolve of American institutions. And I still firmly believe it's one of the only self-correcting countries in the world. So I think that is always a danger of miscalculation that somehow the U.S. is in some sort of slow decline when in fact the fundamentals, I think, uh, were and continue to be fairly strong. Second, I would say to that end, it has uh, direct impacts on uh, Asia policy, and that, you know, to steal some of Ash Carter's uh, words, is that, um, you know, the security foundation of the U.S. treaty uh, alliances, of our presence there in Asia, along with our great Asian partners, friends, the people of Asia, really was a recipe for dramatic success, especially over the last 30 years. And how do we keep that momentum going, to come to your question, was all about the, reba the rebalance. And we basically felt that uh, more security, but in, in, in context or in conjunction with uh, additional security assets uh, in, in a new environment with tectonic sort of plates in Asia moving uh, with China, India, Indonesia, others, we felt that TPP, right, and more money, more emphasis on diplomatic structures. You look at the U.S. rejoined or joined several multilateral institutions in Asia during the Obama tenure. So that was the, the, the basic strategy, in a, in a sense, was to keep the momentum going in a dynamic and changing environment. Final to your question, where is it headed now? I would say the jury is still out, but you know you have seen a withdrawal from TPP. I think that has uh, caused some concern in Asia. I think you've the the other um, elements that I think have from at least from Asian friends have caused them concern is withdrawal from Paris, talking about withdrawing from uh, the Iran deal. In other words, looking like we're less committed perhaps to a rules-based international order at precisely the time the U.S. probably needs to be uh, 
for, out front on these issues. So I think, that, again, I think the jury's still out. It's still only been about eight months of the Trump administration. Who could believe that? Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, and I do think that there is policy making left to be done and important decisions left to be made. Uh, but I do think that it, it is getting to the time where judgments have to be made, policies have to be rolled out to basically assure our treaty allies, but also engage with our friends. And, in, and basically, if, if I were making the policy there, ensure that the U.S remains firmly planted, engaged in what I would argue is the most strategic part of the world. So that's, that, I agree, that is a fundamental question. Is America firmly engaged and planted in this area? And Sashi, to turn it back to you is, so from where you sit, how much does that still feel true that America is firmly planted? And just to put it very bluntly, as we talk here about securing Asia, can America be relied on to help secure Asia? Let me give you a slightly contrarian view. You know, when the pivot was first announced all those years ago. We decided to call it the rebalance because we learned yeah. that every other part of the world felt that we had not yet rebalanced towards them. Asia hadn't felt we were there, and the pivot freaked everyone out, so we talked, we Absolutely. changed the language. Uh, absolutely, because when you say pivot, the assumption, and this was the assumption in fairly high-level circles in Southeast Asia, you can pivot somewhere else if it, eventually, so rebalance is, is much better. From the Singapore point of view, uh, historically, with various U.S. administrations, especially the Republican administrations, there's been this perception amongst the policy community and academia that we can tell the U.S. come in, go out too fast, too slow, almost like we are the pilot of U.S. foreign policy in this part of the world. I don't think Singapore government officials would claim that, but I'm making a what could be an informed comment. So we, we have lost that. We, we aren't that anymore, and there could be a variety of reasons for that. Lee Kuan Yew is not around anymore, and he was... Um, great friends and could be an advisor to people like Reagan and so on, less so with Clinton. So there is an uncertainty about U.S. foreign policy, which Professor Katahara has, 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 has talked about. So if we are not that, and we're also facing uh, pressure from China to rebalance on our end, to be exactly equidistant between China and the U.S., right? Then there's a problem for Singapore as well. Where, where do we stand there? Um, I would say, look at China's soft power there's been a masterful exercise in Chinese soft power, and not just talking about the, the economics of it, Chinese soft power influence in various parts of Southeast Asia, particularly the Indo-Chinese countries. Now, you think back to, to the old days, inasmuch as Southeast Asian youths, our younger generation, have dreams, they still dream of Hollywood, Levi's jeans, maybe now Armani jeans, I'm not sure. So the point is, there is no equivalent Chinese dream among Southeast Asian youths. If the U.S. wants to re-engage, obviously there are all kinds of issues regarding the failed TPP and also South China Sea issues where they have to be much more uh, muscular and we can, we can come to that. But I think reinventing themselves in the eyes of the next generation of Southeast Asian youth, the next generation of Southeast Asian leaders will be extremely important as well. It's interesting. I mean, the, the power of soft power is one that's, of course, talked a lot about. And even so much, it's, it's important. We shouldn't even call it soft power. You know, the... The phrase in the Obama administration that was talked about a lot is, we don't lead by the example of our power, but the power of our example to steal from what many have said. You mentioned that I want to turn a little bit actually towards as hard power as you get, though, which are actually the purchases of weapons, aircraft, major defense expenditures. And one of the premises of this panel is the Asian market actually purchases significantly more of these weapons, even from the Middle East, an area I spent a fair amount of time working on, which argues one of the most war-torn and conflicted in the world right now. Uh, Mark, I want to turn to you for your perspective on just how some of this defense market works. You're now at Boeing. You have a global span of what you're looking at. As you look at the market for defense purchases within Asia, how does it differ from, say, the Middle East or Europe? And, and how do you view some of that as it fits into the discussion that we've been having? No, great question. And I, I'm going to ask in the, in the Q&A, at least Tom Kelly, our former ambassador to Djibouti and with Raytheon uh, now, uh, maybe for his view too. Uh, Tom was the Assistant Secretary for Political Military Affairs at, at the State Department as well. So Tom, I'm, I'm, I stand ready to be corrected and amended. Um, but um, I, what I would say is a couple of uh, things. First, uh, you know, I always get the question, I did when I was in the Pentagon a lot, when I visited Southeast Asia particularly, was that, is there an arms race? Um, is it, you know, and it's, it's hard to tell. I guess what I would say, on, on the one hand, 
there's no doubt that as living standards rise and as countries become more wealthy, especially in a heavily maritime environment, you're, where navies and air forces have been neglected or basically underfunded for years, you're going to see more purchases in that regard. And moreover, I would say, sitting at the Pentagon, um, I would say when I was there, I rightly so, uh, because I think maritime domain awareness, the ability in a very uh, expansive uh, area to basically see what is around you, uh, to enforce your maritime borders, to project power and security are critical. And that's precisely why you need you know, things like P8s, uh, tankers, strategic airlift, just to be, basically be aware and get yourself there. And then obviously the other things follow, but I would say first principles first, be able to see what is uh, in and around you, uh, I think is critical. The second point I would say is, you know, is this, where, where does, you know, healthy defense, uh, healthy p um, patrolling, which by the way gets at a lot of the issues in terms of, you know, uh, counterterrorism as well, cutting off flows of people moving in and around these, um, you know, islands. So um, wh where does that healthy sort of defense stop and where does arms race and tension begin? Right, and I think that's the question everybody's wondering about. I, I don't think we're there yet, to be honest with you, because I do think a lot of these countries have a long way to go uh, in terms of building out, uh, especially their navies and their air forces. So I think that's the second point. And, the, and then the final point I would say is, you know, do, do these arms, you know, especially these big procurements on air force and navies, uh, do they contribute to instability or conflict or do they generally, uh, contribute towards peace and stability, and I would argue, at least at this point, the latter. Uh, and so I do think that the, the these basic abilities to project power, to be able to patrol and secure your borders, to be able to move quickly among vast expanses are really important and tend to play a, a stabilizing role, uh, at least at this point. Yeah, I, I would I think that's excellent, Mark. I, I would add that from where I sat at the Pentagon, I think actually there's a form of, of what I used to think about as defense diplomacy. In some sense, actually, the provision of a large of these amounts of security and weapons was actually a power form of American influence and really helped cement a lot of the alliances that we thought about. Yeah, and just one comeback on that. I mean, it is interesting. You did see that um, when you purchase systems and you, two things started to happen. One, there was a maintenance tether. Right, because when you sit in the Pentagon, you know that about 30% of the costs of weapon systems up front and about 70% of the action is after that, right? And the maintenance tether actually is incredibly, uh, has incredible intangible values in, an, in, in separate and apart from just buying a capable weapon system. There's a tether that comes there and you saw that a lot the difference between where we were with the Philippines in the 90s and where we were when we started to come back in and rebuild that relationship. That, that tether had gone, the maintenance and logistics chains had really dried up, yeah. and that was a real problem. And then the only other thing I would say is that you look at uh, where we're headed, and I would just plug a little plug for Boeing in India, where we're headed, uh, a lot of these countries were headed away from sort of vendor-client relationship and more into strategic partnership because what you're really realizing is that co-production, co-development uh, has basically good industrial base uh, outcomes bo in both countries, but also good foreign policy uh, objectives in tethering the countries together. Right. You're not purchasing a toaster. You know, these, <laughs> an F-35 has a much longer lead time than, than something you take home, unplug, and maybe buy the Best Buy warranty, and then walk away. I, am, I have moved all my stuff back from Korea, and I do need a toaster, by the way. So, Can I, can I interrupt and ask Mark, ask Mark a brief question? There's been a very, very interesting movements recently in terms of Indonesia's strategic posture vis-a-vis -vis facing off against China and the South China Sea issue. Indonesia, as most of us know, has traditionally said it's not a claimant state. They have uh, sovereignty over the Natunas Islands, which does overlap with what China claims are its strategic uh, fishing grounds, traditional fishing grounds. Indonesia is clearly going to adopt a very aggressive, no-nonsense, uh, sovereignty-led uh, posture on this. Is this potentially an indicator or harbinger of future uh, arms purchases from, from your point of view? It's interesting. I mean, I would say, uh, you know, two things tend to drive arms purchases. One, outlook of foreign policy outlook of the governments and two resources available at home. Um, and so I would say, is it a driver? Probably yes, to some extent. Uh, 
second, you know, look, if you look at Indonesia as a country and its needs, they're almost endless, right? I mean, just the vast expanse. So you would think that uh, it would tend to lead towards that. Um, but more importantly, I think, broader picture is that, you know, if there is really any um, chance of a code of conduct between ASEAN and China coming to fruition, which is what the U.S. policy was during the Obama administration to try to effectuate that, Indonesia's got to be central to that, right? Because the Chinese really, uh, it's, it's the one country in ASEAN that when it is engaged and active and uh, polling, it does really uh, get Beijing's attention. And so having Indonesia engaged in this process is, I think, an important and critical and really necessary uh, condition without which you're not going to get as far as you otherwise would. That's great. We, we have a huge amount of things to talk about here, but I want to at this point open it up to the audience. There's a lot of expertise around here, and uh, I think some microphones are going to be coming around. Uh, Wu Xinbo from China. Um, first, uh, a quick comment, and then I have a question. Um, I think the, this panel is really about um, a structure issue, how to secure a fastly changing Asia. Uh, most of the discussions so far have missed uh, this point, except uh, some of the panelists alluded to. Um, I think countries in this region, especially the U.S. allies, have relied on the um, U.S.-centered uh, security approach to, to this region. But I guess this is changing uh, rapidly, uh, partly because of the um, changing balance of power within Asia, and partly because of the uh, declining uh, capability and even willingness on the part of the U.S. So, um, as the uh, Japanese professor alluded to, in the future, um, security of Asia may rely more and more on the internal ar uh, arrangements uh, uh, made uh, uh, among the Asian countries. While the U.S. Uh, role in this process will not be to provide security, but uh, rather to help secure, uh, shape an environment in which Asian countries can work out a better arrangement for the regional security. So that's one comment. Great. The question for, um, uh, for Mark, uh, um, you're from the um, Obama administration. You talk about the, how wonderful the Obama administration has been doing in approaching to Asia in terms of rebalance to Asia policy. Now, uh, looking back on this uh, legacy um, for regional security in the last several years, if there were um, two major security problems, North Korea nuclear issue and South China they dispute. What 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 kind of you know uh, legacy has the Obama administration left in um, solving or managing those issues, right. and how has it contributed to this uh, in terms of the rebalance to Great. Asia policy? Thank, Thank you very you. much. And then Patricia. Hi, Patricia Kim from the Council on Foreign Relations. I have a question for Sashi. Yep. So I was wondering, from the Southeast Asia perspective, how, you know, you talked about Southeast Asians sort of asking the U.S. to do more or less or pull in or pull back. So for, on, in terms of South China Sea, what is sort of that just right amount of activity? What, what would, you know, what would Southeast Asian nations want the U.S. to do? Great question. And then we'll take one more and then turn to our panel. Yes, sir. Kevin Hanley with Merrill Lynch. Uh, last year, all the buzz was about the Chinese uh, aggressiveness in the South China Sea, and the perception is that there's been some sort of stabilization there. Is that true, or is it still uh, fluid? Is it still a dangerous situation? Great. So a large number of questions. We uh, ask our panelists to go through quickly. I think I'll just start at the end with, uh, with Mark, because I think you heard which questions were directed towards you. Yeah. I'll just, uh, just on the comment, uh, quickly on... Um, you know, U.S. role in Asia and Asians talking. I mean, look, I think obviously it's a both and. Um, I think U.S. is there, uh, you know, if I were in the government, I would say U.S. is there to stay for, for a long, long time. I think our, our treaty allies, our, our treaty alliances are up to date. They're modern. They're living documents. They're flexible. You look at, we make changes all the time, and they are very modern 21st century institutions filled with capabilities that I think provide, promote peace and prosperity in Asia. Uh, but I do think, Professor, you make a good point that um, at the end of the day, uh, there is huge value in Asians talking among themselves to try to work out uh, security, political, economic relations. So I would just say both and. And if, you know, like, uh, I'd want both, both scoops of ice cream on that one. That's why I'm 10 pounds overweight. Um, second, um, uh, on, on the South, on sort of uh, 
the legacy of the Obama administration. Sure, look, I mean, what I would say is North Korea is a really, really hard problem. It's really difficult uh, to solve, and it's been, you know, something we've been grappling with as a government for 30 years. But what I would say that the Obama administration did do is, remember, tried and got to an agreement with the North Korea early in the administration, the Leap Day deal, right? That literally fell apart a month after. Enter Kim Jong-un, who is not his father, a different type of leader, more, I would say, argue reckless, less interested in negotiations. And in that, we had to come to terms, I think, uh, both in Beijing, Washington, and elsewhere, Seoul, with a different guy. And I think what we did show is that this guy is really not interested in negotiations, at least at this point. Second, we did rally the rest of the um, six parties, the other five parties in the six party talks to unify them. Uh, third, I think, you know, reluctantly, uh, but ultimately working with friends in Beijing and Seoul and elsewhere, put together the most robust sanctions, uh, uh, UN sanctions in, in history, so, and moved in that direction while keeping the door open to negotiations. Is, is it perfect? Is it solved? Absolutely not. But was there a foundation upon which we could build uh, into the next administration? I would argue yes. South China Sea, um, what I would say there is, uh, you know, again, I think the Obama administration tried very hard uh, on uh, this, the, the front to get the Chinese and the ASEAN countries together into a code of conduct. We've seen some progress there, but ultimately, you know, I think the U.S., what, what it is interested in, and I won't speak for the government there, is trying to ensure free and open commerce, rule of law, and resolving disputes peacefully. And what we did, what we did manage to avoid was a major conflagration in the South China Sea, and I think, and moreover, there is now, I think, a, a decent chance of the Chinese and the ASEANs coming together and work this out. It's not great. Right. Thank you. Sashi? South China Sea, briefly, if you were to take a look at Southeast Asian nations, let's say 20 years ago, you were much more likely to get a, a unified response, a much more muscular response against uh, Chinese moves in the South China Sea. Now ASEAN, the Southeast Asian grouping, has effectively been split by a combination of aggressive Chinese behind the scenes diplomacy uh, and soft power maneuvering. So you get Vietnam, which is really, really against, yeah? Uh, but you have countries like uh, Thailand, which are ambivalent, and you have countries which have basically gone over to the, to the Chinese side, and these include, in my view, uh, Laos and, and Cambodia. So what would be very, very interesting uh, is the US FONOPS Freedom of Navigation Patrols, which uh, they've just announced, I think, an enhanced uh, timetable for these Freedom of Navigation uh, Patrols. And this is, this is seriously cheesed off the Chinese. The intention with which the Trump administration intends to push these through and perhaps even, I don't know, ramp them up. Uh, whether this will be seen as a sovereignty issue by China in the long term, whether this could itself be a conflagration point or whether uh, Trump, the Trump administration just want, does one of its uh, twists and turns and backs down. That will be very important to see. The elephant in the room is really if the in increasing Indonesian awareness that there's something genuine at stake here in terms of sovereignty links itself up with a willingness to play ball more with the, the, the US and the four knobs operations in my view, which hasn't happened yet. But that would be a very, very uh, interesting possibility. Well, uh, maybe two points. One on, on the South China Sea. Japan is concerned about uh, what China has been doing in the South China Sea for several years. Particularly, uh, we are concerned about uh, freedom of navigation and also Chinese attempt to, to build up its military facilities on, on the South China Sea. But I think the dispute can be man manageable because the uh, international community uh, maintains interest in, in the South China Sea question. Japan also has been uh, uh, trying to increase its uh, awareness of the issue, and also uh, we are uh, very keen on uh, developing, uh, helping uh, ASEAN countries to build up its capacity for maritime security. For example, we provided uh, Vietnam and the Philippines uh, with some uh, patrol ships, you know, so, so that they can build up its own uh, maritime security capacity. Uh, another uh, thing is on, on North Korea. Uh, actually, I was in Switzerland this week, early this week, attending a conference where North Korean delegation was also there. And uh, I talked to a lot with North Korean delegates. and uh, That really made me very pessimistic. 
uh, well, this is a close well. <laughs> close meeting, so I can't say much. But but you know that what North Korea has been doing really reminds me of of the Japan of 1930s. You know, North Korea is completely isolated from the international society. Also, North Korea is committed to to you know, expanding its military. Then you know, Japan. What Japan did was you know to attack Pearl Harbor in December 1941. You know, so I'm quite afraid of you know something terrible would happen. You know. If North Korea is, is put in a corner, you know, we can expect some, some you know, nuclear disaster. You know, it's, it's quite possible. Thank wow. You. That got even more pessimistic than our North Korea panel <laughs> from yesterday. And we don't even have cocktails right after this yet. Uh, <laughs> let me, uh, I want to take a few other questions and then, uh, and then we'll sort of wrap up. Japan uh, lives in a tough neighborhood. Um, some of the threats that it faces uh, increasingly look uh, existential. Uh, but at the same time, Japan doesn't have much of a credible uh, deterrent capability. Uh, given recent events, do you see that uh, changing? And uh, if so, how? Great. Deterrence and Japanese threats. And one, we'll take one more. Awesome. Yes. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the um, Chinese aircraft program for commercial aircrafts? Great. So Japanese deterrence and the Chinese aircraft program. And then we'll finish with a lightning round. However, uh, Professor, do you want to take that first, and then Mark will go over to you. Yes, now Japan faces the clear and present danger from North Korea, and we are doing three things. One, Japan is trying to uh, strengthen its own deterrent and defense capabilities, particularly with focus on ISL capability as well as missile defense capabilities. Uh, secondly, Japan has been uh, uh, strengthening uh, its alliance with the United States, not only this alliance with the United States, but also trilateral security cooperation with Korea, with you know U.S., Korea, Japan, U.S., uh, U.S., Japan, Australia, and also U.S., Japan, India. These are trilateral security arrangements. Quite something quite new, but could some, some impact on international security arrangement. And thirdly, uh, Japan has been. Uh, increasingly uh, upgrading its diplomatic efforts vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea. Thank you. Great. Mark, China's aircraft? Uh, yeah, I mean, what I would say is uh, Boeing has a great relationship with uh, China. Uh, we do a lot of uh, work with, with the Chinese. Uh, we have, I think, two joint ventures and just are trying to unveil or open up a finishing center uh, that's new with the Chinese. And I'll just say this in sort of a a quick, a quick word. Look, the Chinese are very strong. Uh, they've made aerospace uh, a, a, a key priority. Uh, they're going to. They they just launched an aircraft uh, about six weeks ago, maybe eight eight weeks ago. Uh, they're one of their first commercial uh, airplanes. And look, we expect that they are going to be very, very strong uh, in this uh, in this sector. Right. Uh, I want to, as we come to a close, uh, go to a lightning round. And we've been talking a lot about the challenges, particularly in the region. In the security environment, I always think when it's helpful to talk about opportunities. So what are the opportunities here that we are not paying attention to in securing Asia? Sasha, why don't I turn to you first? There's one issue which we have not really talked about so far, which is uh, the dreams of a couple of Southeast Asian nations, in particular Singapore, to be smart nations. Uh, completely networked, wired, Internet of Things, multi-sensors, and these kinds of things. And this segues into cyber and cybersecurity where uh, this is not commonly talked about, but it's an interesting side like where the ability or, or know-how to export some of the technical back-end knowledge to cyber, cybersecurity, to Southeast Asian nations, because some of them are starting off from a fairly low base in Southeast Asia. It's going to be really, really important. So that's one, one elephant which I'll just throw out there. I think right. that's going to be quite important. And, and I might add to that artificial intelligence and, AI, and quantum yeah. computing. You know, what is not much understood here is, you know, China has some of the, the best quantum computers in the world right now, something that most Americans aren't really thinking about. But that artificial intelligence and the security threat uh, may be the next thing. Professor, uh, what are the opportunities here that we're missing? Uh, maybe the use of technology for uh, broader security issues, for example, the use of uh, satellites for maritime security, which is something new, but uh, Japan has been uh, started to, to, to exploring that possibility. Great. And Mark, opportunities? Uh, uh, two widely divergent uh, things. One, first, I would say people to people and cultural ties, especially um, in the popular culture sector. I mean, you, you see, I saw this in Korea. 
um, the ability of you know South Korean soap operas to be popular in North Korea, right? Uh, the ability of K-pop stars to be popular in places as diverse as Beijing, Kuala Lumpur, and Indonesia. And the more that that young generation, through shared cultural, even popular cultural experiences, is tied together uh, through sort of this common view of entertainment and use piggybacking off of social media, I think that's just good, right? And I think people don't talk about that enough and people don't sort of realize that that's going on uh, in Asia. I had, a, I had a friend, he was a boarding school classmate of my brother-in-law, he's a K-pop uh, producer and he describes his, one of his K-pop acts being, you know, chased in a good way by all these Chinese women out of, uh, in Shanghai, you know, and so that, that that sort of cultural trends, if the more we can help facilitate that, the more that grows indigenously, the better off we're gonna be. Last, on space, I'll just say, completely different subject, lots of areas for quantum and cooperation in space, uh, really interesting technological AI applications, uh, also just in terms of getting nation states, scientists, and the scientific community together working on a common goal, common projects. I think space is really, uh, I guess, the final frontier. I'll stop there. Well, thanks, well, look, well, as we, bring this panel to close. I, I, before I thank my panelists, I just have a few thoughts about what we've come together. I think there are three things that have really emerged in an interesting way from this fascinating discussion with our great panelists. I think first, the, the scope of the issues in the countries is larger and more complex than we think about it is far deeper than the United States, Korea, Japan, but extends deeply as much to Indonesia, to Thailand, to Singapore, to India. And as we think about the Securing Asia picture, the chessboard has many more pieces and many more squares than we have anticipated. At the second point, we really are at a critical turning point, I, I think it's come out of the panel today. It is not just a new administration, any new American administration is the cause of some uncertainty, but it is a time right now where there are a lot of longer term trends that are now converging with right now. We're only eight months in, but as we meet next year, it's interesting to understand what decisions and choice have made that made a consequence. And I think the third piece is, as we bridge this panel to some of the other discussions having today, there are tremendous opportunities. It is very easy for us to be focused on the costs and the dangers, particularly as you think about defense expenditures, North Korea, and we rightly should. But as one of my old bosses at the Pentagon said, we are missing a huge part of strategy if for every problem you don't look for opportunities. And I want to thank our panelists for articulating both of those. Please join me in thanking a really terrific group of panelists today. <laughs>